you are now entering into the praise zone where you get your praise on. Hello, I'm your sister in Christ, Michelle Rice, and I will be your praise pilot for this heavenly flight. We will be going up, up, up in the high praises of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. While you're in the praise zone, getting your praise on, the Father will enthrone the praises of his own. So come on, get your praise on in the praise zone. Let us pray. Father God, we give you glory today. We give you honor today. And we bless your holy name because you're so good and you're so kind. God, we are in the praise zone today, God. And every time we come in your presence, God, we just want to praise you and lift you up and give you glory today, God. Hallelujah. Sometimes, sometimes, God. We don't always have feeling like it, but we got to press into a praise. Sometimes, no matter what the affliction, no matter what the situation, no matter what the problem, we just got to press. And to a praise, hallelujah, trials and tribulations, situations and circumstances. But sometimes you got to press into a praise, hallelujah. We just got to give you the praise that's due unto your name on the praise zone. God, we just got to give you the sacrifice of praise. Sometimes we might not feel good. Sometimes we might be discouraged. Sometimes we got the enemy coming at us from the left and the right. We got enemies surrounding us and shooting darts at us and throwing swords at us, but God, that's the best time to press into a praise. That's the best time to lift up your head. O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, and let the King of glory come in. Who is this King of glory? He's God Almighty, the Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He is the King of glory. Sometimes it is necessary to enter into a sacrificial praise. That means the sacrifices. Even when the situations don't dictate for a praise. You make a praise. You just lift up your hands and begin to lift up God. And say glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. And give him the praise. So God, right now as we enter into this praise. We know this praise is so powerful because you would have the praises of your people and we begin to praise God our enemies begin to drop down hallelujah because there is a weapon in the praise and there's a praise in the weapon and we take out our praise weapon and we begin to praise God the enemy has to flee our enemy becomes our footstool, everything that tried to block us, every ten thing that tried to put us in a bind, to put chains on us, put our feet in the stocks, put our feet in fetters. Oh, that's the best time to enter into a praise. Enter into a praise and give God glory. Oh, it changes the atmosphere. Sometimes the atmosphere is oppressive. Sometimes the atmosphere is depressing. Sometimes the atmosphere is full of chaos and confusion. But when you lift up your hands and when you begin to praise God, the atmosphere begins to change. We shift the atmosphere today. Hallelujah. On the praise zone. Father God, we give you praise. Hallelujah. We give you praise and we boast in you all the day. In the name of Jesus. Well, saints, I'm so happy to be here. It's a joy of my heart to sit in this seat, this holy seat, and to share the good news, the good word of God. God is good. And today we got a special, special, special topic. And it's simply called None Cries Restore. See, God is in this season. This is a prophetic word. It's not just a message. It's just not a sermon I whipped out the back seat. It's not just something that a couple of scriptures we're going to read and we're going to go home. Today, I believe by faith, this is a prophetic message. And God today is going to let you know through these words, through these scriptures, that God is in this is a season for restoration. It's a season for restoration. Yes, I know things have been stolen from you. Yes, I know you feel like the enemy has robbed you. Yes, I know you feel like you've been plundered. Yes, I know how you feel because the enemy comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. But Jesus Christ, hallelujah, comes to give us life and life more abundantly. And today you're going to find out that today God is saying in this season, in this season, 
God says, I come to restore. I come to restore. Which leads us right to our scripture today. Our first text comes from Joel. Joel chapter 1, 1 through 4. Let us read. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear ye this, O ye men, and give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Yes, the prophet Joel, he was talking to the people of God, God's chosen people. He was asking them a question. He says, you got to hear this. You got to hear what I'm about to say. You got to hear what I'm about to decree. You got to hear what I'm about to declare and what I'm about to tell you. I'm asking you, have you ever, have you ever heard it? Have you ever heard the words that I'm about to release out of my mouth? Have you ever seen it in your generation? Have you ever seen it in your lifespan or in your father's lifespan or your father's, 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 father's lifespan? God, he said, here's the words that I'm about to release. And these words that I'm about to release, I need to know, verse 3 says, you need to tell ye your children of it. And let your children tell their children. And their children another generation. He said, the word I'm about to release to you today is so anointed and so powerful and so on time and so in God's timing and so in the Kairos time of God that you will definitely, you won't dismiss this word. You're going to tell it to your children. Your children's children, your children's children's children, and your children, children's, children's children, all through the generations. Now, this word's for you too. Are you ready to hear it? What is God saying in this season? Let us read verse 4 of Joel chapter 1. It says, That which the palmer worm have left, the locust have eaten. Hallelujah. And that which the locusts have left, the canker worm have eaten. And that which the canker worm have left, the caterpillar have eaten. Hallelujah. The same verse, verse 4 in the Amplified Version, reads a little bit stronger. We get the understanding of it more. Let's read it. What the crawling locusts left, the swarming locusts have eaten. And that was the swarming locust left, the hopping locust have eaten. And that was the hopping locust left, the stripping locust have eaten. He was describing all types of locusts. And what was Joel telling to the people of God? He was saying the locust has been released. My God. The locust has been released. Now, in this chapter, in this situation, the locusts, the devourer, the ones that come to want to eat up the things in your life, the locusts was released for the people of God in this season, in this text, it was because of disobedience. God was trying to get the people, his own people, his chosen people to repent, to turn from their wicked ways. So he, he kept pleading with him and pleading with him and pleading with him. And then he said, you know what? The devourer has been released. The locust has been released. Now, on the other end, the locust can be released in your life not because of disobedience. It could be because of truth, because of your obedience. Okay? Now, in this chapter, Job, let's read Job chapter 1. Job was a righteous man. He didn't do anything to bring upon him the calamity. Hallelujah, that came upon him. He was righteous. Let's read verse 8. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and hates evil. So here we see Job was a righteous man. But in this chapter, in this chapter of Job, he was the locust, so to speak, had was released in his life because of righteousness. He was persecuted because of righteousness. He was an upright man. He hated evil. He eschewed evil. He, he was a man after God's own heart, so to speak. And the locust still was released. We see in this first chapter, 
things were destroyed. I mean, his family was destroyed. His house was destroyed. All his riches and his all his possessions were destroyed. And even the enemy began to work on his body. His health was all destroyed. The only thing Satan couldn't do, he couldn't. He couldn't. Hallelujah. He couldn't kill him. But the locust was released. The virus was released. So how do you change this situation? Yes, I see it, Lord. Because of disobedience, and like in the book of Joel, but if it, the locust was released for, for because of disobedience, it's a simple way out. A simple way out. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So you just repent. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7.14, 7, if my people, see God talking to his people, just like he was talking to the people of God in the book of Joy. He said, my people who are called by my name, if they would just humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal the land. And then he says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attempt unto the prayer that is made in this place. So if the locust was released because of disobedience, God says, just turn. Hallelujah. Just turn from your wicked ways and I'll heal the land. I will restore. And if you've been righteous, hallelujah, and you, it was, the, hit, the locust hit you because of righteousness, God says it's still not going to be the end of the matter. Because God says, I got plans. I got plans for you. I know the locust has been released. I know the devourer has been eating up your finances. Somebody said, you don't understand. He's in my marriage now. And it's coming against me, me and my spouse. And we're always arguing and fighting. It looked like we're about to get divorced. That means the locust has been released. The devourer has been released. So you don't know, Sister Michelle. Oh, yes, in my finances, that's one thing. But now he done moved up in my ministry. It seems I can't do what I used to do. It's, it's all much confusion. Too many blockages. Too many barricades. I just, it just, I just can't. It's just too much. It's, it's just so overwhelming. God said the locust has been released. Say, so even no matter what the situation is, and no matter what you're going through, God says, I got plans. I got plans to restore you. Today, Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of good and not of evil. To give you a hope and a future. Yes, God got plans. He got real big plans. He said, I'm going to restore you. I know the locust has been released. I know you've been suffering. I know you've been going through. I know you've been losing things and time is passing. Your life is passing and things are not happening. But God says, I got plans to restore. I'm not going to leave you in the predicament that you are in. This is not your lot in life. The situation that you're in is not your permanent condition. God says, I'm going to restore you. One translation says he'll give you hope and your final outcome. He's going to give you hope and your final outcome. He's going to restore. Let's, let's turn back to the book of Joel. Let's read Joel 2, 21. It says, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice. For the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, nor for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. He said, and the floors will be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Here we go. Remember he got plans to restore? He says it again. I will restore to you the years that the locust have eaten, the canker worm have eaten, the caterpillar have eaten, the palmer worm have eaten. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Because I know what you've been going through, but that's all right. That season of famine is over. I'm coming to restore you the years. Somebody said, you don't understand. I've been... It's like nothing. It's like I, I, had, I thought by now I'd be further along. It just the years have been stolen from me. Just because I'm restoring the years. I'm restoring your wealth. I'm restoring your health. I'm restoring your relationships. I'm going to restore. It's my plan to restore. Hallelujah! It's my plan. 
But then we sit here and we think, okay, we know it's God's plan to restore, right? You know it because the word says so. But what is the hindrance? If God is sovereign. God is great. He's greater than anything. If this is God's plan to restore, then what's going on? I'm not seeing restoration. I'm not seeing it. The locusts been released. I'm not seeing the restoration. God said, what is it? But do you know as children of God, we are co-laborers with God? Let me say it again. We are children of God, but we also are co-laborers with God. We got to join in God. We got to hook up with God in our own restoration. Yes, we do. And we're going to find out the key to this thing that God's waiting on us. Do you know that? God says, I got, I, that's my, I got the plan. I got the plan to restore. I want to do this thing. The devil ain't running nothing. I'm running the thing. But you and I, you and I, sisters and brothers, we got to do something. And Isaiah 42 tells us exactly what the problem is. Let's turn there. Isaiah 42, verse, starting at verse 22. Here we go. He said, but this is the people. Isaiah is talking. He's prophesying to, to God's, talking about God's people. Just like Joel was talking about God's people. You and I. He says, but this is a people robbed and spoiled. They all of them are snared in holes. They're hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth for a spoil and none cries restore. He said, this people, my people, who are called by my name, I'm not talking about another, another guy's people. I'm not talking about another deity's people. I'm not talking about another entity's people. I'm talking about my people. My people are robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivers for a spoil. And none cries restore. God said, I got plans to prosper you. I got plans to restore your wealth, your health, your family, everything that concerns you. But you're not saying nothing. You got to open up your mouth and agree with God and say, God, I'm agreeing with you. I'm declaring and decreeing that in this season, in this time, it's my time for restoration. He said, but none cries restore. Which is the title of this message. None cries restore. Let's read the same verse. Isaiah 42, 22 in the Amplified Version. It says, My people are robbed, plundered, snared in holes, hidden in prison houses of bondage. They're made of prey and a spoil. The Message Bible. My people are battered, cowed, or they're shut up in attics, shut up in closets. They're victims, licking their wounds. They're feeling ignored and abandoned. This is with the NIV version. It says, my people are plundered and looted. They're trapped in pits. Uh, they're hidden in prisons. Uh, they're plundered and none is none is called is called for a rescue. They are made loot. In other words, he says, um, I want to restore, but I'm not hearing a sound. Heaven got to hear a sound. Heaven got to hear the same sound. God's decreeing it on in heaven, but he's waiting for an earthly sound. He's waiting for a man, a woman, a boy, or girl that would open up their mouth and say, God, I'm agreeing with you. I claimed restoration. I claim it in the name of Jesus. I claim my money to be restored, my wealth, my health. I declare it and decree it. I prophesy in this thing. I'm agreeing with my God. My business is going to flourish once again. My marriage will be restored. My children will be saved and taken off of drugs. I'm declaring and decreeing what God is saying on earth as it is in heaven. God's waiting on a sound from earth because the sound has already been released in heaven that it's a season for restoration. Season for rest. Now let's look at a woman of God that she knew. That she couldn't keep silent. See, see, sometimes we get too quiet. We get real quiet in the spirit, real passive, real apathetic. And we just say, okay, I'll pray for a couple of days. And I'll say it for a minute. When they, But see, you got to get kind of dogmatic about the thing. You got to get relentless. 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 Let's look at Luke chapter 18. This is talking about a woman that was relentless. She says, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to get what's due me. Let's read Luke 18. Hallelujah. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. 
And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary! Avenge me of my adversary! And the unjust judge would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God or regard man, because, but because of this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Blessed by her continual coming, she weary me. And God is saying to you right now, Hallelujah. Hear what the unjust just said. So this woman, and um, she kept saying, in one translation, translation, she said, she kept coming to the judge and says, my rights are being vi violated. My rights are being violated. And he said, you know what? I don't care about God. I don't care about man. I don't care about this woman. I don't care about nothing. But she just, she just won't stop. She's relentless. She's dogmatic. She's keep on in pressing in. She keep on enduring no matter how I treat her. She's persistent. She's like a dog with a bone. She just won't stop. She ain't quiet. I'm just tired of it. Just I will avenge you of your adversary. I will give you your rights. I will re I'll give you justice. And I will give you what's due you. I will give you what's rightfully yours. Legally yours. He did it. How much more would God? Move on our behalf. We just join up with him in a relentless prayer. You got to you gotta put your hand on the horns on the altar and say, God, it's my season. I know it's my time. I feel it in the spirit. Oh, I release it. I release everything that pertains to me and my household. I release everything that pertains to my family, my church. I release everything that pertains to my sisters and brothers in Christ. I release it. I release it. everything that's been bound. I release it. Whatever I bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And Whatever I loose, you gotta loose your stuff. Give me my stuff back, Satan, in the name of Jesus. She got back what's to her. She did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's look at another widow. Just as dogmatic. And she said, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to get what's due me. I don't know about you. You are you. But I, today, I'm going to get back what's due me. Because God is saying to me, restore Let's look at 2 Kings 8. 2 Kings 8. Hallelujah. Glory to the holy name of God. Here we go. 2 Kings chapter 8. Glory to his name. Then speak Elisha unto the woman. Let me stop there. I'm give you a little background. Elisha was the predecessor of Elijah. Elijah was a prophet that did supernatural miracles, all kinds of things that have never been known to man. And here was Elisha following after Elijah. And he raised a woman's son from the dead. And here we go. Let's read. Then spake Elisha unto the woman whom son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thy household, and sojourn whatsoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. So he told her, woman of God, you got to go. Because God has called for a famine upon his land. It's going to last seven years. So you need to get up, uproot yourself, take you and your family, and go. Just go sojourn wherever you can. Go live wherever you can because there's a famine on the land. And it's going to last seven years. So the woman in verse 2 says, she arose and did after the saying of the man of God. She went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And she did what the prophet said. Verse 3. And it came to pass at the end of the seven years, the woman returned. Somebody said returned. The woman returned out of the land of the Philistines and she went forth. Somebody say go forth. She went forth into the land of she went forth, and it came to pass as the seven years in the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. She says, I'm going to cry out for my restoration. And the king was talking with, uh, the king was talking to Gehazi, which was Elisha's servant, and the servant was telling the king, all the great things Elisha had done, how he did all these miracles, and how he really, he really raised a woman's son back to life. And in verse um, three, 5, he says, And it came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, 
that behold, behold the woman, the woman whose son he restored to life was right there and she was crying unto the king for her house and for her land. Hallelujah. And the king asked the woman, is it true what his servant say, Gehazi said about Elijah? She said, yes, king. So the Lord appointed unto her a certain officer saying, restore, restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day she left the land even to now. She ran, she came to the king. She cried out for restoration. She said, I want my land back. I want my house back. And he said, he made a decree. He says, I restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day she left the land until now. I call that retroactive restoration. But God goes way back. Hallelujah. And restore everything in the past that you lost. All the fruits of the field, he said, give back to her. That means all the money from your business. Hallelujah. Let's read another translation of the same verse. The NIV, NIV version says, give back everything that belonged to her. Give it back. Including all the income. All the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. Mm, mm. The message Bible says, same verse, make sure she gets everything back that was hers, plus all the profits from the farm from the time she left until now. You see what happens when you open up your mouth and you cry with story that you get dogmatic. You get some, get some oomph to you. Get a little grit to you and pray and it'll see the fight that devil. That stuff is yours. It's due you. It's rightfully yours. She got back everything. She just didn't get back her land and her house, but she got retroactive restoration where you go back. For, he went back seven years. He said, you know what? All the income that she would have had, if she had been there, give it to her. All the profits she would have been coming into her life, if she had left the country seven years ago, to give it to her. Retroactive restoration. God is going to go way back and give you back everything that was stolen to you. Was it seven years ago, 12 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago? I don't care if it was 60 years ago. This is a season where you're going to get retroactive restoration. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Somebody else got some restoration. Holly, who was it? You all know the story. We touched about it earlier. Job. Let's look at the book of Job. Hallelujah. Now we know the story of Job. Everybody knows the book of Job and the story of Job. And it says that in verse 1 that there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. This man was a perfect and upright man that feared God and hated evil. And his substance was great. He was rich. Come on. Rich is not a dirty word. I know it's a four-letter word, but it's not a dirty word. He was rich. He was really rich. <laughs> I'm saying, it says his substance was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household so, so that this man, somebody say this man, this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. He was the richest man in, in the land. He was. But because of righteousness sake, he wasn't disobedient. Nothing he did that was wrong. God says he let the test come. A test came. He was proven to, to the enemy that this man is a righteous man. And the hedge was removed. And we know the story how everything was just devoured from Job. His land, his all his all this produce, all his animals, his family, his health, all his material goods, everything he owned was destroyed. It was destroyed. But see, God didn't leave him in that predicament. That was not Job's lot in life to remain in, in this devastated situation. Let's look at the end of the story. Somebody said the end of the story. I want to know the end of the story. The end of the story says in verse 10, 
42.10 of Job. It says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Somebody said, double blessing. Somebody said, just receive the double. Receive the double. And it goes on to say, there, and then it, it says, There came unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all that had been of his acquaintance. And they bemoaned him and comforted him of all the evil that had come upon him. And every man gave him a piece of money and an earring of gold. Hallelujah. He gave, they all gave him an earring of gold. And here we go, saints. It says, the Lord blessed the latter end. Hallelujah. Somebody say latter end. Ladder. So, 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 I want the latter end blessing. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep. Remember, he only had seven. He had 6,000 camels. Remember, he only had three. A thousand yoke of oxen. A thousand she asses. And everything was restored to him, even his family. And God let Job live a long, full life. He was restored double for his trouble. He, somebody said, receive the double. Just receive it in the season. Receive the double. The double blessing. Let's read the same verse of uh, verse 10 in the Amplified Version. It said, the Lord turned the captivity of Job and restored his fortunes. See, that's not always a spiritual or soulish blessing. And we know that God does restore in the spirit and the, in our soul. We know Psalm 23. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. And he restoreth my soul. So it's good to get your soul restored, but it's more to it. And we know how uh, David prayed in Psalms 51. He says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. So God's in the restoration business of your spirit and soul. But don't get too religious and X out the fact that God want to restore your money. He do. This is right here. Read it. Come on, read it. It says, he restored his fortunes. Fortunes is money and wealth. Come on, somebody. Get up off of me, Satan. He didn't want us in poverty. Get up off of us. We ain't got to stay in poverty and devastation. He restored his fortunes when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Material restoration. Your wealth, your money, your stuff. Let's read this chapter in um same verse. In NIV verse, it says, After Job prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again. He made him prosperous again. It just wasn't the soul of the spirit. Come on. It was his wealth, his fortunes, his stuff. So I want my stuff back. Okay. Now we know that God wants us to cry with store. Agree with heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to get to the seat. We did the second half an hour of this show. We're going to get into the practicality. Show me how to do this, Sister Michelle. I know it's God's will. I believe you. I believe you. I read the scriptures along with you. I know it's God's will to restore. I seen how he restored the widow woman in the book of Kings. I see how he restored the widow woman in the book of Luke. I see how he restored Job in, Job in this chapter of the book of Job. I believe you. I believe it's God's will to prosper me to get my stuff back. What, what do I do? Well, let's zoom all the way to Proverbs 6. Okay, we're going to find out in the name of Jesus what I got to do. Practical. Give me some tools. Let's read uh, Proverbs 6, 30 and 31 in the King James Version. It says, Man do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. Man do not despise a thief if he still to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found out. Come on. He shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. He said if you. If you. If, you, if, you, if, if the thief be found out. Because see we uncovering the devil. We are exposing the devil. We pulling his cloak of darkness off. We, we, we pulling off that. 
that's riled right now and he's been found out. Satan, we know you are the thief. God, our God, my father, our father, our daddy, he is not sitting in heaven withholding my blessings, withholding my money, withholding my house. He's not withholding my riches. He's not sitting in heaven holding your stuff back. He wants you to be blessed. Come on. Come on now. He wants you to be blessed. But who is the culprit? It's not God. And I keep begging God. Beg, come on, God, do it. Come on. No, 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 no. He's not the culprit. He's not the one we should be zeroing in on right now. The enemy. This verse says, if he be found out, he got to restore. Satan, you found out. You are exposed. You can hide in the darkness. The light shines into darkness, and the darkness can't even comprehend it. You got to restore. Let's read the same verse in the NIV version. It says, men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet if he is caught, the caught of Satan. If he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. He got to restore even though it costs him all the wealth of his house. Let's read that in another version. How about the message Bible? It says hunger is no excuse for a thief to steal when he is but when he is caught we caught you. He got to pay it back. Even if he has to put his whole house in hawk. Satan, you're caught. Now you now you it's gonna cost you something, Satan. Don't think we're gonna just passively get our stuff back and let you get off the hook. The devil is a liar. He says you it's gonna cost you all the wealth of your house. You gotta put your whole house in hawk. Now, he said Satan got a house? He got wealth, you know. If Satan does have a house, in other words, he has a territory. He has a domain. He has a turf. He has a place where he abides. Remember, he's a prince of the power of the air. Yes, he dwells in that heavenly sphere on the second heavens. He has a place of domain. He has, like, so to speak, a house. And he got wealth. But my question is, where did he get the wealth from? God didn't give it to him. Some. And it let me, I was thinking, I said, you know what? He got somebody's stuff. Let's read Luke 11. He got my stuff. How do you get wealth? You a marauder, Satan. You are a thief. You are a legal alien. You should have my stuff. My stuff is my stuff. God gave it to me. It was a blessing for the righteous. Before we go to Luke 11, let's look at Psalms. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for leading me. Psalms 112. Hallelujah. Let's read. It says, Wealth and riches shall be in his house. Whose house? Let's go up and read. It says, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord, that delights greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth, and the generation of the upright, the generation of the upright, the generation of the upright endureth forever. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. Whose house? The generation of the blessed. It says, wealth and riches shall be in his house. And his righteousness endureth forever. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. The house of the righteous, his house. So, how we just read in Proverbs 6, they, if he be caught, he has to give up all the wealth of his house. Someone, Satan got wealth. Riches in his house? But where did he get it from? He got, he stole it. He stole it from the righteous. Because the wealth, only the wealth and rich should be in the house of the righteous. It should not be in the Satan's domain. So let us turn to Luke 11. We're going to find out about our stuff. You know, it's almost as if Satan got your stuff in a, in a, in a big you, in a big you store. All your stuff has been accumulated over the years, over the decades, over the time. Just collecting your stuff. Because remember, he has, God did not give him wealth and riches. He don't have it. It's supposed to be in the house of the righteous. But let's read about Satan 
and how he has collected our stuff and how he operates. This thief, this marauder, this alien. It says when a strong man armed, you study this out, Luke uh, 11, 21, and 22. Don't have time to go into deep, deep details. I want to get to a point about the enemy, the thief. Remember, he's exposed. When a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. When a strong man. This text tells us the strong man, if we study it out, and I know you will, because I know you're studious, is Satan. He's a strong man. He has a palace. And he has goods in his palace. That's what it says. It says when a strong man arm keeps his palace, his goods are in peace. Yes, Satan is a strong man. He got a palace. He got a domain. He got a turf. He got territory. And he got goods. He got goods. But let's read verse 22. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him. Give it back. He take it for him all his armor where he trusted and divides the spoils. So we see this strong man got a palace. He got goods. But we learned in Proverbs 6 that the, if the thief be caught, he got to give up all the goods and all the wealth of his house. His house. He got your stuff in his house. He got your goods in his house. He got your goods in his palace. But the stronger man, which is Jesus Christ himself, Jesus Christ in us. Jesus Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us is a stronger than he. The Bible says we shall overcome him and take from him. That's what it says. He taketh from him all this armor where he trusts and divide the spoils. So when you take authority over the enemy and you come and you stay there, you keep fighting. You don't you don't give up. You be relentless. You be dogmatic. You be have some stick to itiveness to you. You have some perseverance. You just keep on at it. When you do that and don't give him no space, don't give him no rest. It says that he we take from him his armor and that he trusted, and we begin to divide the spoils. What's the spoils in it? What that mean? The spoils is anything you win from a battle. It's called the contraband. Some people call it booty. B-O-O-T-Y. The booty, the, the contraband, the, 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 the things you get when you fight and you win. It's all like a reward. And you start collecting stuff from the enemy. Take back that. Take back this. Take it back. It's spoils. It's called spoils. It says we divide the spoils. It's what you win when you defeat an enemy. It's what you win. It's what you get back when you defeat a foe, when you conquer a demon, when you conquer a foe, when you conquer principality, when you conquer a, a enemy. This is contraband. This is the spoils. 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 That word rang a bell. Let's look at 2 Samuel verse 30. We're going to touch on that right quick. 2 Samuel verse 30. 2 Samuel chapter 30, I believe. Let's look at that. Let's see what we got here. Oh, bless his holy name. Now, in this chapter of 1 Samuel chapter 30, the enemy had came against David. David was running from King Saul. He ran to the providence of Ziglag. Then he had enemies there after him, the Amalekites, the Amalekites. Burnt down their, their houses and land. They stole the captive, the women. They just robbed them. Like Satan robs us. Burning down, stealing, just taking captive stuff. That don't even belong to him. So David asked God. Like we need to ask God. Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I conquer? Shall I overtake? And God says pursue. For you will recover all. Recover all. You will recover all. And I'm telling you today, you will recover all. And it says in verse 18, David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil. Remember in chapter 11, we divide the spoil after we overcome. Here it says that Everything was restored to him, even the spoils. That means that's the that's the, that's what he win after he conquered the devil, conquered his enemies. 
It says, David took all the flocks and the herds which they had drave before them and the cattle. He said, this is David's spoil. In other words, when you go through a battle, you've been going through some trials, tribulations, it is isn't stealing, robbing, looting, plundering, uh, spoiling. He says, when you come out of this thing, do not come out empty. Come out with the spoils. Come out with your money and your brother's money and your sister's money. Come out with your daddy's money and your daddy's daddy's money. I mean, go way back. And get everything that you stole from your family members. You got family members that was robbed and looted and plundered and stolen from. They didn't know the word of God. They didn't know they could take back everything that Satan had stolen from you. But you know. So you get everything. Get your spoils. When you come through a trial, you get the contraband. You get the loot. You get the booty. You get the stuff. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. So we get more practicality. We learn what we need to do. Getting back to the point how you have to be enduring, how you have to be persevering, how you got to have stick to itiveness. Let's read about our mouth, how our words have a lot to do with how fast the restoration comes. Let's look at Isaiah 53. We're going to get an example right from the scriptures where Jesus is involved. Jesus, of course, involved from Genesis and Revelation. But we're going to see something. How Jesus Christ himself made a way for you to open your mouth and get back everything. Everything he stole from you. And your mama's stuff. Your daddy's stuff. Your sister's stuff. Your cousin's stuff. Boo stuff. Baby stuff. Get, get everything. Just get it all back. <laughs> While you're doing it, just go ahead and do it. Just look at Isaiah 50, 53. 53. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to our God. Let's read Isaiah 53, verse 7. It's talking about Jesus now. It says, Jesus, or he, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep for the shears is done. And he opened not his mouth. I mean, he bore our grief, carried our sorrows, yet he opened not his mouth. He was despised and rejected, but he opened not his mouth. He was, he, had, he was acquainted with grief. He was despised and we esteemed him not. But Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, he opened not his mouth. And I, and I was listening, listening to this tape by powerful man of God. And he dropped a, a very strong point. He said Jesus didn't open his mouth. He could have called. While he was on that cross, he could have called legions and legions of angels to come and set him free. He could have called. When he was put, put, pressing them. The crown of thorns on his head. He could have called angels to come and fight and, and, and stop the whole thing. When he was tortured, when he was beat, when he was spit on. He could have called legions of angels to stop the whole process. But he didn't. It said he opened not his mouth. Why didn't Jesus open his mouth? Because see, if Jesus had opened his mouth, we would have been a men most miserable. We wouldn't have authority to open our mouth and get back what we're supposed to get and declare and decree and to prophesy. He was silent. He was quiet. So we don't have to be quiet. We don't got to be silent. We ain't got to have mute. We ain't got to have our have our voices on mute. We can, He gave us an authority because he was quiet. He got the victory. He got, he got the he got the victory. He got the victory. He got the triumph. He got the triumph over the enemy. So we can open our mouth and begin to decree and begin to declare and command restoration. Command it to come back. Command our families to be whole. Command our money to come back. To command our bank accounts to be full. He gave us the power. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't stop the process. Because he know if I stop the process, my people are doomed. They can't have, they won't have no authority. They won't be able to bind and lose. They won't have no authority in their mouth but because he was silent. He didn't open his mouth. Now, I, Michelle, you, Sally, Carol, Gigi, all of you people, Johnny, Joe, now we got the authority to open our mouth 
and decree, declare, to prophesy, and to go into the enemy's turf and get back everything that he has stolen. Everything that he has stolen. We got the power. We got the power. And remember, is this not things in the spirit? You know, we, we do know we can restore his joy, our, restore our peace, we restore our comfort. We you know that's good. And we, you know, we're storing our soul and spirit. But since sometimes we get so religious and we forget that we are spirit, soul, and body. We, we, we are part of a physical world too. And then it means we run a rough shot in our physical realm, stealing from us, stealing. But God is saying, today, I've given you authority. Jesus said, I was quiet. I didn't open my mouth. I didn't say a mumbling word. So you can open your mouth and say something. The Bible says in Isaiah 42, none cry with story. We're not going to let that be our story. That won't be our testimony. The God has to look back at us like in Isaiah 42. and said, this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivers. For none cries restore. In this season and time, God won't have to look at us and say, you know what? I had so much for them. I wanted to restore, but they would say nothing. They was quiet in the spirit. They were passive. They didn't, they didn't open their mouth and get back with their own words. My words I put in their mouth. It's like fire in the name of Jesus. It's a consuming fire. Now getting back to the point of opening our mouth and speaking to what thus saith the Lord, going after the enemy territory, going into his turf, taking authority, and then declaring the decree what we want and what should be restored. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's like a praise break because we are in the praise zone. God, we glorify you. God, we magnify your name. We thank you, Lord God, that we're about to be restored. The years that the canker room has stolen is going to be restored. Our wealth, thank you, Jesus, is going to be restored. Our health, Lord God, we thank you. In advance, is going to be restored. Our family is going to be restored. Our businesses is going to be restored. Our households is going to be restored. Our ministries is going to be restored. Our purpose and our call and our plan of the plan of God in our lives are going to be restored in the name of Jesus. God, we glorify you and magnify your name and we thank you for restoration has come to our house. Now, getting back to the fact, the last point I'm going to make, don't get settled in just restoration in the spirit and in the soulish realm. Get your stuff back in the natural. You need your stuff to fulfill the will of God. You need money to do your ministry. You need money. You need it. You need the things in the natural. I'm not just caught up in the flesh, but you can't deny the fact that you need your material things too. And this, and look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It says, for you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, though he was rich, Talking about Jesus, though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that through his poverty, you might be rich. Oh, oh God, you hear what I'm saying? It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was, though he was rich, yet for your sakes, and my sake, he, be, he became poor. That through his poverty, we might be rich. See, we don't got to be poor. We ain't got to stay poor. He said he became poor. Jesus was in the glory realm. He was in heaven, walking on the streets of gold. Pearl, pearls, it, the gates was made of pearl. He was rich. But when he came on this earth, he became poor. That now through his poverty, we can be rich. Rich is not a dirty word. It's a four-letter word, but it's not a dirty word. It's a good word. He wants to make you rich in your finances, rich in your health, rich in your wealth, rich in your relationships, rich in your business, rich in your ministry, rich. He became poor. That I might be rich, but I got to open up my mouth and say something. I can't be quiet in this time and in this season. Hallelujah. Bless his name. We know it because we're going to be on it now because we know the truth. And the truth will make us free. 
Let's end in Isaiah 61. Oh, glory to God. Oh, none cries restore. Let's change that. I'm crying restore. I know we started off with God is telling us that we're not crying restore but at the end of this thing. Because it's the end of a thing that matters. We, we are crying restore. We're going to get our stuff back. Isaiah 61. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isaiah 61 4, 4 says, And they shall build the old ways. And they shall, talk about the people of God, they shall build the old ways, and they shall raise up former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. What is this saying to me? That they shall build the old ways. They shall raise up former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities of many generations. God says in this season, we're not going to be selfish. We're going to go back and get everything the enemy stole in our former in generations. How he desolated our parents and our parents' parents and their parents and their parents' parents. We're going way back, retroactive restoration. Going way back and claiming everything. Everything you stole from my grandfather. Everything you stole from my great-grandfather and his father. I want it all back. Give it to me. We're going to go, go back and going to be quiet in the spirit. Let's read the same verse. In the NIV version. Hallelujah. It said they will rebuild the ancient ruins. And restore long places devastated. They will restore long places desolated. And they will renew the ruined cities. They have been devastated for many generations. Mm, mm, mm. We're going to restore the places that were long devastated. We're going to restore the things that have been devastated for many generations. It's a new day. It's a new day. We, we are being restored, not only us, but our fathers, our father's fathers, our father's father's fathers. So, therefore, our children and our children's children and our children's children and to many generations can walk in the fullness that God has ordained for the people of God, his chosen generation, his peculiar people, his people that's called by his name. Hallelujah. Restore. Restore. We are restored. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Well, before we leave this broadcast, I will be remiss if I didn't pray a prayer of salvation for those that want to be restored back to Christ. Today, I want to pray for backsliders that once walked with Christ. But see, he's married to the backslider. He wants me to restore to you this, your, your, your relationship with him. Restore. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I'm calling to that one that want to be restored. Ah, oh, he is saying, God, I don't know how to come back home. But God is saying to you today that you might be the prodigal son. You might be the prodigal daughter, but today God says, my arms are open wide. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you shall find rest unto your soul. God says, come unto me, daughter. Come unto me, son. Repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm coming home today. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. I'm coming home. I repent of my sins. You said of my people. Who are called by my name. If they just humble themselves and pray. And turn from their wicked ways. That says all you need to do is turn from your wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive your sin. And I will heal the land. I will restore you back into fellowship. Hallelujah. That broken fellowship will be restored. Forgive me God. Forgive me. I'm coming home. Now, if you pray this simple prayer, I believe, I know that the angels are rejoicing in heaven. God is doing a twirl, a flip, a back flip. All in heaven is a party going on because God's people are being restored back into fellowship. In the name of Jesus. Well, saints, I think it's about an hour. It's up already. It went so fast. It was so good. Because God is good. His word is always exciting and renewing and upbuilding. And I will see you 
next time on the Praise Zone, where you get your praise on with your sister in Christ, Michelle Rice. See you later. Love you. Bye-bye.